please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Tuned into Power Breakfast on this Friday morning. I'm Ekta Batra, and with me is my co-anchor Nigel Rasuza. Hi, Nigel. Hey, Ekta. End Good of the week. <laughs> end of the week, Ekta, and some optimism in the air as well. It's going to be an exciting Friday. The Asian markets, the Japanese markets, they have opened up lower. Remember, they were closed in yesterday's trading session, so that market sitting with a cutoff around four tenths of a percent. On the data front, Japan's flash manufacturing PMI for the month of November came in at around 53.8. That compares with around 52.8. That's the highest levels we've seen since March 2014. So just keep that in mind. That data point looked quite good, though we have the Japanese index that's trading with some pressure. It was down close around half a percent. Currently, it's down close to around four tenths of a percent. But uh, remember, the action is going to be really on the Chinese markets. Yesterday in the final hour of trade, we saw quite a sharp sell-off, so we'll keep an eye out for those markets. But for the time being, let's take a quick check on the Kospi. That was doing a relative outperformance. It was trading with a gain of around two tenths of a percent, currently holding mildly in the positive terrain. And the other couple of markets as well have opened up more or less flattish. That would mean that the SGX Nifty as well is indicating a more or less flattish start. Okay, well, all eyes will be on China market opening today. Remember, the plunge in China's bond market is driving mainland stocks lower there, especially financial-related shares. Yields on the sovereign debt and top-rated local corporate notes have climbed to what we've seen as the highest level in three years as a deleveraging campaign has gathered pace. With more than $1 trillion of local bonds maturing in 2018-19, it will become increasingly expensive for Chinese companies to roll over financing. Okay, well, moving on to the U.S. markets now. They were closed for Thanksgiving holiday, but President Donald Trump gave a bullish Thanksgiving address to troops overseas, hailing progress in Afghanistan and against ISIS, and telling them they were fighting for something real. He also lauded stock market gains and promised big, beautiful, fat tax cuts big, fat, beautiful tax cuts. And hopefully we'll get that, and then you're going to really see things happen. So as we give thanks for this holiday, I know I speak on behalf of all Americans when I say that we totally support you. In fact, we love you. Well, uh, in the European markets, we had equities finishing on a relatively flattish uh, note in trade yesterday. I think the CAC was a relative outperformer. It ended with a gain of close to half a percent. Volumes were low. Obviously, you had the Japanese markets that were shut yesterday on account of Thanksgiving as well. The U.S. markets uh, were shut. So um, the CAC, in fact, was the big outperformer. In terms of data, well, the Eurozone flash composite PMIs came in a tad bit higher than what the Shield was working with. In fact, some of the data points indicated that it came in at 79-month highs. So just keep an eye out on that front. Also pull up a couple of markets, the emerging markets. Let's see what they did in uh, yesterday's trading session. Remember, for majority of the week, they were moving around. In fact, yesterday, they ended as flat as can be. Okay, well, moving uh, to Germany specifically, Angela Merkel is poised for a fourth term after coalition talks collapsed in Germany. The country's biggest opposition party, the Social Democrats, said they are ready for talks with Merkel's conservatives on supporting a minority government led by the long-serving chancellor, offering a way to restore political leadership in Europe's biggest economy. And Robert Mugabe has uh, reportedly been granted immunity from prosecution. That's as part as the deal that led to his resignation at Zimbabwe's president earlier this week. Zimbabwe granted its former president immunity from prosecution, a generous pension, and told him his safety will be protected in his home country. Meanwhile, he'll be on the search for a new home after being booted out of his state house. Okay, and uh, Bangladesh and Bang Myanmar have finally struck uh, a Rohingya repatri uh, repatriation deal. Bangladesh has agreed to send Rohingya Muslims back to Myanmar. More than 6 lakh people could be deported back to the country that has been accused of ethnic cleansing by the U.S. As and the U.N. Bangladeshi officials said the displaced could be returned within two months. And the currency space then, the U.S. dollar remained under some pressure after minutes from the U.S. Fed Reserve's latest policy showed 
that in fact some members highlighted concern uh, over uh, the persistently low inflation. The euro on the other hand held on to overnight gains after strengthening for the third consecutive session. In the world of commodities, crude oil has hovered near two-week highs on the shutdown of a major crude pipeline from Canada and a drawn fuel inventories. Crude market is also tightening due to an effort led by the OPEC and a group of non-OPEC producers, including Russia, to withhold output. The deal to curb production is due to expire next March, but OPEC will meet on November 30th to discuss the policy. Okay then, turning our attention to the precious metal space, gold prices, they have uh, nudged lower with investors taking profits after the near 1% rise that we saw in the previous trading session on the weaker US economic data, as well as concerns about some uh, Federal Reserve policymakers they had in terms of inflation. Well, for yesterday's trading session, it was another day of consolidation. Uh, it seemed to be a little volatile on an intraday basis with the market ending absolutely on a flat note. But largely, it seems as though we're taking a breather after the strong run that we've seen since mid of last week. And we seem to be um, just about consolidating at these current levels. Remember, global queues have been subdued as well because the US markets were closed on account of Thanksgiving. So let's see how we're trade how we're poised for today's trading session. Nigel, what do you think? Well, Ekta, you know, yesterday we're expecting volumes to be a tad bit on the lower side. That's global participation because, as Ekta mentioned, yes, the Japanese markets were shut, the US markets as well were shut. So we were playing really to our own music uh, yesterday. We recovered in the last hour of trade, but we ended more or less flattish. That's because of averaging. Remember, the last 30 minutes, the close price that you get is more or less uh, the average of the last, uh, last half hour's trades. The key gainers yesterday, you had the two big boys. They put their hand up. They said, let's get had counted Infosys as well as Reliance Industries both of them did well and if you take a look at Reliance Industries that's telling you you know the way this market is moving we saw a bit of a correction towards the 880 875 odd mark and from there that one in fact you know the 200 point rally that we've seen on the nifty from around that 10,120 till around 10,350 well Reliance Industries has played its role and even in yesterday's trading session it was really doing the heavy lifting between Reliance Industries and Infosys, we were up closer around 25 points. But the HDFC twins, they came in for selling pressure. And that's the reason, in fact, we had a relative underperformance coming in, even from the Nifty Bank. Remember, put them together, they're more than 15, 16% in terms of weightage on the index. So when they end in the red, definitely, it does put some pressure. And if it wasn't for HDFC Bank yesterday, well, the Nifty Bank would have ended well in the green. We ended down closer on 30 points primarily because of HDFC Bank. The, you know, more than the equity markets, the Indian rupee, that told you that the market is sensing something. Is S&P going to go the Moody's way? Is there going to be some positive commentary that's going to come out from there? Because there was a considerable amount of strengthening. In fact, the rupee ended virtually at the high point of the day. But we'll wait by to, you know, to see whether or not there is some commentary that comes out of there. Let's focus on data points that we have. Institutions, they were net buyers yesterday. They bought closer around 300 crores between them, both the FIs as well as the DIs. They were buyers. And intraday, you got a sense, well, there were some long positions that were added on the Nifty futures. The premium did expand from around 15 to around 18 points approximately. Remember, we have expiry that's going to play out next year. There is some bit of those rolls already happening because the Nifty futures, well, we did see some bit of unwinding on that front as well. And maybe, in fact, some positions getting rolled forward to the next series. The PCR moved higher to around 1.35, telling you there was a good amount of action on the put side. By the end of the day, we understood that, in fact, the FIs, they sold more than 500 crores. What were they doing? They had bought a lot of calls and puts. So yesterday, they were unwinding both calls as well as puts, uh, as we saw. But on the index options, you know, they unwound some, uh, some 4,400 4, calls, call contracts that were written. The good part is they're writing puts. So even at these levels, 4,000 put contracts were written. I'll take that as a bit of a positive. The 10,300, 10,200 puts, both of them were active. Between them, more than 11 lakh shares were added. So let's get both those two strikes up for you, telling you that, in fact, if we get those plates as well up, they'll tell you that, in fact, the bulls are looking to defend the 10,250-odd mark. Short point is the Nifty is still stuck in that 100-point range, 10,300 to around 10,400. Those are the levels we're looking at. And in terms of highest open interest, the 10,300 becomes very important. Next week, we have expiry. 
that's where the highest open interest is. So the bulls, 10,250 is the level you're looking to defend. But keep in mind, we'll say the market's not doing much. Few themes if you played this week, you'd be making good money. 10 to around 30%. Specialty restaurants, McLeod Russell, tea prices have moved higher. And surprise, surprise, Apollo Hospital as well, up more than 8% in this week. Okay, and stocks? Stocks, you know, since we're talking about some of those FNO queues, we'll be looking at some of those uh, stocks that went into the FNO ban and some of them that came out. So we have around 13 stocks that are in the FNO ban. That means you can't take a fresh position in the FNO market. The new one that came into uh, the ban is Fortis as well as Jet Airways. Remember, yesterday Fortis did see a bit of a bounce. Jet Airways has seen a considerable correction from the recent peak. So let's keep an eye on that one. What's come out of the FNO ban? Indocount. That's been a rather volatile stock of late. That one as well, you should keep an eye on that. Well, Motilal, they've come out with a note on Bata. They have downgraded it to sell. They are saying that, in fact, you know, uh, though we could see some kind of margin expansion, they are, they are, the reason that they have downgraded it is because it's trading at around 30 times its forward earnings. And uh, the current price largely captures most of the valuation. Um, besides that, we're looking at the insurance companies. Well, yesterday they got a hard hit. Remember, the taxation was continue. You know, that that's going to be a bit of a niggle for them. All these three companies, you should keep them on your radar. Yesterday they ended with sharp cuts in trade. Let's see whether or not we could see a bounce back. But otherwise, this concern is likely to, uh, uh, to go on. Infosys, the stock that we spoke about earlier, if you take a look at the delivery chart, well, there's less trading, there's more amount of delivery that's taking place. So keep an eye out on that one. I don't know whether we are bracing ourselves for some kind of announcement. And Reliance Industries as well. Keep an eye out on both those two heavyweights. If they can hold one end up, then maybe, in fact, we could head towards those fresh all-time highs. Ekta. Well, the move to tackle the reoccurring menace of bad loans, the president has signed off on the ordinance to tweak the insolvency and bankruptcy code. The fine print of the changes comes with a big twist. It's not just willful defaulters and those convicted <coughs> of fraud. Defaulting promoters in general are set to lose their companies. The law reads, and I quote, in order to strengthen further the insolvency resolution process, it has been considered necessary to provide for prohibition of certain persons from submitting a resolution plan who, on account of their antecedents, may adversely impact the credibility of the process under the code, end of quote. Well, Lata joins in with more details on what this could mean. Lata. Now, that preface was very important. Uh, the law, the amendment or the ordinance begins that this is the stated intent that people whose antecedents, whose previous behavior has led to uh, you know doubts about their credibility will not be allowed to participate uh, and thereby spoil the credibility of the code that is the almost the preamble of the ordinance in that light we are banning the following people from bidding for plants if they are in undischarged insolvents uh, if they are willful defaulters and the third one which is the most biting if their accounts are classified as npa under rbi rules for over one year such persons, this third category, if they clear all their overdues, they are allowed to uh, apply. But uh, while being a defaulter, they are not allowed to uh, apply and rebid for their own plants. And then there are others, uh, people who have, uh, uh, you know, been disqualified as director under the Companies Act, who have been prohibited by SEBI from, uh, uh, you know, entering the securities market because of uh, uh, whatever misdemeanor people who have indulged in preferential treatment or uh, understated uh, transactions. In, in uh, you know other kinds of uh, laws which they have flouted, they also cannot apply. But of all these categories, the one that will sting the most mm -hmm. is the fact that promoters mm -hmm. who whose companies are 90, uh, uh, you know NPA for over one year cannot apply unless uh, they clear all their overdue. So this clearly means you know in a nice way to say promoters, you all are out. You all cannot bid. Even when the plant goes for liquidation and it is torn out limb by limb, the movable and the immovable property cannot be sold to the promoters. So it, the law does say that you know next time you are you are uh, you know defaulting, watch out. Okay, all right. Uh, but, uh, the the immediate impact will be negative for negative. banks because uh, if Very the promoter were bidding, higher. the other bidders would have bid higher than the mm. promoter. So there would have been some competition. The expectation was the promoters would do anything to keep their plant and therefore bid higher. But now with that competition gone, banks will probably have to sell the assets for a song. But, uh, well, in the longer term, this is extremely welcome in terms of good corporate behavior.
Okay, all right, Lata, thanks so much for explaining that to us. Well, we spoke to two former deputy RBI governors, SS Mundra and KC Chakraborty. On one hand, SS Mundra believes that we must distinguish between the outstanding amount and the overdue amount, while uh, Mr. Casey Chakraborty believes that promoters can participate if they make the account standard. We need to distinguish between the outstanding amount and overdue amount. Right. Yeah, when we are talking about the entire amount, it is the outstanding amount, not the entire amount is overdue. But then there are technicalities, and those would need a clarification because technically, uh, the way banks execute the document, if there is a default in paying an installment or a cross default, mm. technically they can say that the entire amount becomes callable, and in that case it is overdue. I think it is quite reasonable. Promoter can participate, provided he can make the account first standard. If you look, overdue means after respected the overdue amount, and before we structure over the amount, because you see, as per the new definition, so that needs to be clarified. Reserve Bank has to clarify it. But all of what I am saying that I don't agree that entire amount has to be paid back. It is only the overdue portion that has to be paid back, which the bank feels or Reserve Bank criteria by the account becomes standard. Amount should become standard. Okay. The Niti Aayog recently came out with its roadmap for India's electric mission 2030. The think tank feels that India's vision of mass conversion to electric vehicles can create a $300 billion domestic market for EV batteries by 2030. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC TV 18's Ashpreet Sethi, Niti Aayog CEO Amitabh Khan said India must not only be a manufacturer of electric vehicles, but also an exporter by 2028. See, our assumption is by 27, 28, uh, you'll have a huge uh, fall in battery prices. And the battery prices, which are, uh, they comprise about almost 50% of the EV car, their prices would have fallen uh, from US dollar 273 kilowatt hours to 73 dollar kilowatt hour. And that would, by that time, you will have uh, the price parity between uh, internal combustion car and an electric car. And in a globalized market, which India is, you will have a lot of push for EV cars. Now, by that time, India should do, get into global size and scale, not only become a manufacturing base, but also export because manufacturing of automobile and auto components is very high. Mm -hmm. It's about 49% of the manufacturing in India. Mm -hmm. It comprises 7.2% of India's GDP and accounts for a lot of jobs. And therefore, whatever we do, it's not about just manufacturing, but it's also about export. Mm -hmm. And it's about doing things to global size and scale. So what we are pushing for is battery will be the key. And we need an energy storage mission, which we've talked about and how to go about it and how to uh, assess the potential for fee bid. That is, how can the electric vehicle cross-subsidize the emergence, the, how could combustion vehicles cross-subsidize the emergence of the EV cars in India? So both these we've opened up for debate and discussion because we are in the midst of a very disruptionist phase in India. This sector is going to transform India in many ways, lead to innovative and sustainable urbanization in India. And it's very important that whatever we do, we do it to large scale, we do it to push manufacturing, and we do it to make India become an exporter of EV cars, batteries, and also uh, interoperable charging stations. Thank you. But you did speak about sharing on battery swapping so as well, but you? Nitin Gadkari hmm. has said that he doesn't agree with the policy or the idea that Niti Aayog is proposing. So, so our view about? always has been that uh, it's not about electric vehicles, it's about sharing and connected vehicle. Hmm. Sharing connected and electric vehicles. We feel that it's not just electric, you have to share vehicles, you have to connect vehicles, and that's the way the world will move. Uh, Mr. Gadgari talked about swapping of batteries. Niti Aayog had not said it, it was an idea by one of the professors and to which he had reacted.